Welcome to this comprehensive video course on GraphQL, the cutting-edge query language designed to empower your data retrieval needs for modern web applications. Throughout this course, you'll learn its core principles, explore its advantages over traditional REST APIs, and gain the practical skills to design and implement robust data-driven applications. This beginner's course was developed by the NetNinja. He is one of the most popular GraphQL instructors on the internet. So you're in good hands. Hey there gang, and welcome to your very first GraphQL tutorial. Okay then, so although I do already have a GraphQL course, it's about five years old now, and I wanted to make a fresh up-to-date one with less bloat. So that anyone wanting to get up and running with GraphQL quickly can do here before diving into more advanced tutorials and projects using it. So in this series, we'll be learning what GraphQL is and why we'd use it. And then we'll build a GraphQL server from scratch using Node.js and the Apollo server package. We'll also look at how to make queries to that server using Apollo Explorer, which is a free tool for testing different kinds of queries. Now, before you start, I would already expect you to have a basic understanding of Node.js because we'll be using that to make our GraphQL server. So if you want to learn that a little bit more, first of all, which I highly recommend, then you can check out my Node.js crash course on NetNinja Pro and also on YouTube. So I'm going to leave a link to that course down below the video. You're also going to need a recent version of Node installed on your computer, which you can get from nodejs.org. Just click on this download button and then go through the installation steps, dead easy. And then finally, before we start, I've made course files for this entire series. You can get them from this repo on GitHub, GraphQL Crash Course. The link to that is also going to be down below the video. Now, each lesson has its own branch. So if you want the code for a specific lesson, you can head to the branch drop down and select that branch that corresponds to that lesson. Then to download the code, just hit the green code button and download a zip folder. Or if you prefer, you can clone the entire repo to your machine. So then let's get started by talking about exactly what GraphQL is and why we'd want to use it. So GraphQL is what's known as a query language, which is what the QL in the name stands for, query language. And by query language, we mean a specific syntax that we can use to query a server to request or mutate data. So it's kind of like an alternative to the more traditional approach of sending standard requests to a REST API using endpoints. But whereas using a REST API is more of an architectural style, an approach to serving and fetching data, GraphQL differs in that it's an actual query language with its own syntax and rules. And it still uses HTTP requests under the hood like we normally send to a REST API. It's just that we have this nice query language sitting on top of that to give us more flexibility and control about how we make them and what data we want to fetch or mutate. And also the way a GraphQL server handles those requests is very different to how a typical REST API would handle them as well. So let's take a quick look at those differences and see why in some cases GraphQL has the edge. So when we use a REST API, we typically send HTTP requests to specific endpoints like this to interact with a certain type of data, right? For example, we might send a get request to this endpoint to fetch a list of Pokemon. And we could also send a post request to that endpoint to add a new Pokemon to the data set. We might send a get request to an endpoint like this with an ID on the end of it to fetch a single Pokemon with the ID. And we might also send a delete or put request to this endpoint to delete the data or update it. And the server would handle requests to those endpoints by connecting to a database probably where the data was stored and either fetching the data and sending it back to the client, the browser, or updating or deleting the data from the database instead. So this is your traditional REST API. And for the most part, it's really effective and a good way to expose data to clients. But there are sometimes some drawbacks when it comes to using a REST API when your application scales and your data gets a little bit more complex. Now, the first drawback is something called overfetching. And overfetching is when we request some data from an endpoint and the server sends back too much data, so much more data than we actually need. For example, I might have an endpoint, which is forward slash courses, and that gets all the courses. So that request goes to the server. The server gets the courses from the database and sends the whole list of them back to us in JSON format. Now, each course object might have a ton of different properties like an ID, the title, 
the author property, which contains author name and the author ID, maybe, the price, a thumbnail URL, a description, a video URL, and so forth. And it might actually be that in this case, we only need the ID, the title, and the thumbnail for each one, because that's all we're going to be showing on this particular page. And so the rest of this data for each course is pretty much obsolete and we don't need it for anything, which means that we've overfetched what we do need. So that's the first drawback, overfetching. The second drawback is the polar opposite, underfetching. And underfetching is when we don't get back all the data that we need from a single request. And it could lead to making multiple requests to different endpoints to collate everything that we need together. For example, we might send a get request for a single course. The server handles that request by getting the course from a database and sending it back in JSON format. And it might look something like this with an ID, title, thumbnail URL, description, the author property, which contains the author name and the author ID, the price, video URL, etc. And in this case, we need all of those things. That's great. So we show all of those on our course page on a website, but we also want to show additional stuff on the page about the author of that course as well. For example, the other courses that this author has made and information about those courses, such as the title, the thumbnail, the ID, the price, and so forth. And we don't have all of that deeply nested data here in the course object that we got back. So we've actually underfetched what we need in that single request. And that could mean we now need to make additional requests to the server to different endpoints to get back that additional data. So these are two potential drawbacks of using a REST API when your data layer gets a little bit more complex. And these are two things that can easily be solved by using GraphQL instead. So now let's look at how GraphQL works and how it combats both overfetching and underfetching. So first of all, when we send a request using GraphQL to a server, we typically do that to a single endpoint, which might be forward slash GraphQL. And this is totally different to when we used a REST API where each resource typically has its own set of endpoints for get, post, delete, and put requests, etc. So whenever we send a query using GraphQL to the server, it's always going to be sent to probably that single endpoint, and then the server can handle it. Now, the way that we send a query to the server is by using a special GraphQL syntax that looks something like this. And we're going to talk more about this syntax later on in the course, but essentially this syntax allows us to specify exactly what data and what fields we need back from the server. So in the example from before, if we want maybe the courses data, then we can send a query that looks something like this. So we'd specify that we want the courses resource and for each course, we can also specify which properties we want back as well. So in this case, that would be the ID, the title and the thumbnail URL. So we'd send that query and the server would respond with a JSON array of courses where each one of those courses would only have those properties that we need. So there's absolutely no fetching going on there whatsoever, which is really good. The other thing GraphQL allows us to do is fetch nested related data within a single query. So again, for the example before where we needed a single course, we'd send a query like this one and specify whatever properties we need from that course. But we also said that we wanted extra information about the author of that course, along with any related data or any related courses rather that author made. And we can do that in GraphQL by nesting those properties inside the query. So I can say, get the author name, ID and then also get the courses of that author where for each course I want to get back the ID, the title and the thumbnail URL. And all this is done in a single request or query. So we're no longer underfetching the data that we need, which is really cool. And this right here is one of the really good things about using GraphQL, the ability to nest any related data we need into a single query instead of making multiple queries as you might do when you're using a REST API. So that's the basics of why GraphQL might be beneficial to you and your application, especially as, like I said before, you scale up the app and the data layer becomes a bit more complex. Now, at the moment, you've only seen how to retrieve data here, and we'll look at this more closely later on. But you can also perform something called mutations to do things like ask the GraphQL server to add new data or update it or delete it, much in the same way a post request might ask a REST API to add new data or a delete request would ask the server to delete some data. So we're going to talk much more about that later on in the course as well. So in this course, then we'll be making a GraphQL server from scratch using Node.js and a package called Apollo server. And that server is going to be responsible for handling all the queries and mutations that we send to it. 
Now, to send the queries, we'll be using Apollo Explorer, which is a GraphQL client that we can run in the browser. You can kind of think of this as a bit like Postman, but it's the GraphQL equivalent. And Postman, by the way, is a free tool to test out REST APIs. So you're going to learn how to set up a GraphQL server and also how to make queries and mutations from the front end using this kind of GraphQL syntax. So then my friends, that's the introduction out of the way now. In the next lesson, we're going to go over the basic syntax of making queries. So then before we get started actually making a GraphQL server that can handle all of our queries, I wanted to go over the basics of this query language right here and show you how we typically structure these queries from the front end. Now to do this, we're going to be using Apollo Explorer, which I showed you briefly in the first video of the series. And Apollo Explorer is a way for us to send test queries to a GraphQL server and see the responses that we get back from it. Now you might have worked with something called Postman before, which is for REST APIs, and it's basically a GraphQL version of Postman, what we're using here. It allows us to test and send queries as we would from a front-end application without having to actually build a front-end. So the way we're going to be making and sending queries from here is essentially the same way we'd be sending them from a client-side application like a React app, for example. So this window right here is where we're going to be making the queries. And then to send them, we'd press this button right here. And the response from the server is going to show over on the right. Now for this lesson, I'm connecting Apollo Explorer to a backend GraphQL server I've already made. And it's the one that we're going to be making through the rest of this series. But you can also use something called the Apollo Sandbox, which you can find on the Apollo Docs right here. I'm going to leave this link down below. And when you open the Sandbox, it connects to a dummy GraphQL server. So you can play around with requests without having to worry about making a server yourself. But for now, I'm going to go back to the Explorer connected to my own GraphQL server because that's more pertinent to the rest of this course that we're doing. So then how do we make a query using GraphQL? Well, first off, we'd use this word query. And then after that, we can give our query a name if we want to. For example, I'm calling this one reviews query because I'm going to be fetching reviews from the server. Makes sense, right? So you can call this whatever you want. Then we open the curly braces and inside these, we specify what data resource we want to get back. Now, a GraphQL server can expose multiple different resources to the clients. For example, they might expose the reviews resource, an author's resource, a user's resource, a games resource, etc. And we can specify any of those resources right here as our entry points for the query. So right now, we're saying we want to jump into the graph on this resource entry point. In essence, we want to fetch the reviews data to begin with. Now, on its own, that's not going to do much for us because although we've said we want to get the reviews data, we've not specified which fields from each review that we want to retrieve. Now, this is one of the major differences between GraphQL and using a REST API because when we send a request for a resource to a REST API endpoint, we don't then specify which parts of that resource we want to get back. We just get the whole lot back. But in GraphQL, we can manually choose which fields from this resource that we want to fetch. And the way we do that is by opening curly braces again and then writing down whatever fields we want. So I could just say, get me the rating field of each review. And if I press send now, I'll see the response is a bunch of review objects, each one with just the rating field. Awesome. Now, if I want more fields, I can just list them inside these curly braces right here. So I could say that I want the content of each review and also the ID of each review as well. And now if I hit send, you're going to see this time I get back all of those fields in each review object. So this is a really cool feature of GraphQL, only getting back the fields from the data that we actually need. Now, before we go any further, I want to just jump to some slides to quickly explain from a bird's eye perspective how we query the graph and move around it to navigate data. So when we make a GraphQL server or API, we're making something called a graph, right? And a graph in visual terms is basically a bunch of connected data that looks something like this. So in this case, we've got three different data types. We've got reviews, authors, and games. And we can choose to jump into the graph at any point that's exposed to us by the server when we make a query. And from there, the GraphQL layer allows us to traverse or walk through this graph to also fetch any related data to that starting point, right? So we just made a simple query whereby we requested all of the reviews data 
and specified which fields we wanted back for each review, right? So the reviews resource was our jumping in point. We landed right there. And from there, I could say, okay, also get me the author of each review that I got back. And I could also specify which fields of the authors that I want to get back as well. And the query would look something like this. And the reason I could do this is because when I made the GraphQL server, I connected these data resources. I said that each review was related to an author who wrote that review. And the author is a separate resource. And all of this data would be brought back from a single request. We've only made one query and sent that one query to the server. We didn't have to first get the reviews and then make a second request for the authors of each of those reviews, even though it's a separate resource that we're getting right here. Another example could be that my initial entry point to the graph would be a specific game with a certain ID. And the query for that would look something like this, where we specify the ID of the game that we want as a variable. Now, we'll learn more about query variables later on, so don't worry too much about that for now. But then, having jumped in at this point on that game, I could also say, get me any review related to that game. And from those reviews, just get me the rating field. And to take it one step further, I could also say then, get me the author of each of those reviews and just give me their name. So you can see how this general idea of a graph allows us to initially jump in somewhere and then navigate between related data and fetch it all in a single query. And that is the crux of GraphQL. So let's try one of these queries with nested related data again in Apollo Explorer. All right, so we saw before that we had this reviews query where we fetched all the reviews and we got the rating content and ID for each one. So we got those back, right? But now we can also get nested content. So say for example, I want the author of each review. Now this author is actually a separate resource. So they don't have author properties, these reviews. They're a separate resource, but they're linked to reviews. So the related data, and we've specified that, or I've specified that in the GraphQL server. We'll see how to do that later on, but let me just show you how we can fetch this stuff now. So from the author, I could get the name and the ID of the author. We also have a verified property to say whether they're a verified author. Now, if I click on this, we're gonna get all of the same stuff here, plus the author details. So it's grabbing that as well for each different review. Now we could also get the game associated with each review. So down here, I could say game and then inside parentheses or rather curly braces, we can say which properties we want back for the game. So I could say the title of the game, the price of the game and also the platform of the game. And it looks here like we don't actually have a price property. So let me get rid of that. I mustn't have added that. So let me just leave it with the title and platform. Press that and we can see now we get the title of each game and the platform of each game as well, which is an array of different platforms. So these are three separate resources, author, game and reviews, but we're getting them all back from the same query. And we can take this one step further if we wanted to. We could say, okay, well get me all the reviews now associated with each author, for example. So let's do it right here. We can say we want the reviews from each author. And from that, we just want the rating and we want the ID of each review. Click on that. And now you can see nested inside the author, we can see the other reviews that they've done. And again, we can take this one step further. We can say we also want the game for each one and we want the title for each one. Now this is getting a bit complex. I probably wouldn't make a query this complex. I just wanted to show you how we can work with this related nested data. All right, and how flexible it is. That's really cool, isn't it? All in one query. So like I said before, we can also have mutations to add new games if we want to, delete games or reviews, whatever it might be, to update different records. So we're gonna see all of that later on as well. So now hopefully you can understand a little bit more about how these queries are made and how we can fetch related data within a single query. Now, there is much more to GraphQL than making queries like this, but for now, I think that's probably enough to get us started. I just wanted to make sure we all have a little bit of an understanding of this general syntax. So in the next lesson, we're going to start making our very own GraphQL server on the back end. All right then, gang. So now we want to make a brand new GraphQL API, and to do that, we'll be using Node.js and a library called Apollo Server. 
An Apollo server is one of many different libraries that you can use to easily spin up a GraphQL server, and each library has their own kind of take on it. But the nice thing about using Apollo server is that it automatically spins up an instance of the Apollo Explorer for us on localhost, which we can use then to test out our API. So when we use Apollo server, it's gonna create a GraphQL server for us that then allows us to easily set up resolver functions that can respond to incoming queries. It also lets us easily model our different data types like authors, blogs, reviews, etc., and decide how they're all connected on the graph by making something called a schema. So we'll talk more about that in the next lesson, but for now, let's go ahead and make a new node project and install Apollo Server. All right, so I'm on the Apollo docs right here, Apollo Server, and I will leave this link down below. Just click on Get Started, and this is gonna show us how to make a new project with Apollo Server. So the first step is to make a new directory, then CD into that, and then we initialize a new project, a new node project using NPM. We also set the type to be module, and that allows us to use ES6 modules. So we can say import something from something rather than require. And it also allows us to use top level await as well. Once we've done that, we have to install a couple of dependencies, GraphQL, which is the meat and bones of GraphQL. We need to install that, but also Apollo Server. And that's the GraphQL library that we're gonna use, which makes it really easy to spin up a GraphQL server, make schemas, types, respond to queries using resolver functions and all that jazz. So it just makes working with GraphQL so, so easy. So we're gonna install both of those right here. Now, if you're using TypeScript, then you can follow these directions. We're gonna be using JavaScript and basically we're just opening up the index.js file or rather we're making one and then opening the uh, the file up and notice here we have that type set to module inside package.json as well. So once we've done that it's all set up and we can go ahead and start defining the schema the resolver functions and all that stuff. So to begin with let us go up here I'm just going to copy the installs up here so these two things so we can use them in our project. All right, so I've opened the terminal right here and navigated to this directory where I wanna make the project. Then I'm gonna say npm init and then hyphen y, and that's gonna create our package.json file for us. I also want to say npm pkg, and then we want to set the type to be equal to module that allows us to use ES6 modules. We'll see that inside package.json in a second. Then I'm gonna open up this directory in Visual Studio Code. So code, then a space, then full stop, press enter, and it's gonna open up this project for us. So inside package.json, we can see that the type is module, awesome. Okay, so now we need to install those dependencies. So open up a new terminal, and you wanna paste in the npm install that we grabbed from the Apollo docs. So it should be at Apollo forward slash server, and also GraphQL. So press enter to install those dependencies. All right, and now that's done, the next thing I'm gonna do is create an index js file and this is where we're going to set up our apollo server for graphql so the way we do this is we first of all import a couple of things so i'm going to paste these in we import apollo server from at apollo forward slash server that was the package we just installed and then also we import this thing start standalone server from at apollo forward slash server forward slash standalone so basically this apollo server is for us to set up the server and configure it and tell Apollo how to handle all of our different types of data and respond to queries and things like that. This one right here, this is just to start up the server so we can start listing for requests. So after we've imported both of those things, I remember for this to work these import statements, we need to be saying the type is module over here. Anyway, after we've done that, we can do our server setup. So we can say const server is equal to new Apollo server, like so. So that's this thing right here. All right, like so. And then down here, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but down here, I'm gonna say const, and then URL, the destruction here is equal to await, and then start standalone server. So that's the other thing we imported. And then we pass in this Apollo server we just created, and then as a second argument, an object, to say right here, we want to listen to a particular port number. So we pass an object as the value here, and we say the port is 4000. And then down at the bottom, I'll just do a little console log, console.log, and then in here, I'll say server ready at port 
and then it was 4,000. Okay, so we've got the basic setup sorted now. We're using Apollo to create a new Apollo server, and we start the server using this method down here. Now, the Apollo server takes in an object as an argument, and that object expects two properties. The first is one called type defs, which is short for type definitions. And these are basically descriptions of our data types and the relationship they have with other data types. So that's what we're going to be looking at in the next lesson. But the other property is a resolvers property, which is basically a bunch of resolver functions that determine how we respond to queries for different data on the graph. So in the next lesson, we're going to look at that first property type defs, and we're going to make up our own schema. All right, then, my friends. So now we're going to make some type definitions and then later on as well, some resolver functions, which we can then pass into the Apollo server so it can do its magic with them. So let's start with the type defs. What are type defs? Well, type defs are definitions of the different types of data we want to expose on our graph. For example, we might make a type def for an author data type and specify the different fields that author might have, like a name, an avatar URL, a bio, etc. And we might have one for a game, which has a title, a price, a platform, etc. So these would be the different types of data that we want to make available on the graph that a user can then eventually query. And the combination of all of these different types and the relationship to other types and the kinds of queries that can be made combine up to make something called a schema. So the schema is something that describes the shape of the graph and the data available on it. And normally your GraphQL schema, the data that's available on the graph will be fairly similar to the data you're storing in your application database. Now it can be different. They don't have to fully match or anything because GraphQL is a layer between your database and client side queries. But generally speaking, the schema will probably look fairly similar to the kind of data that you have in your database. So, Let's try making a schema then with a few different types of data that we want to add to the graph. Now to do this, I'm going to make a new file called schema.js. And inside this is where I'm going to define all of my different types of data. Now, before we do anything inside here, I want to show you a package I've got installed. So just typing up here, GraphQL, and it's this one, GraphQL syntax highlighting. So what this does is it allows us to have syntax highlighting for our different types in our schema, because without this, we wouldn't get that. So if we scroll down, it might show you an example. You can see down here, if we keep on going, this is how we're going to be using it, using a template string. And then we start the template string with hash GraphQL. And if we do that, when we're making our types inside that template string, we're going to get syntax highlighting on them. So definitely install this package, first of all, or a similar one. Then if we go back to the schema file, the way we're going to do this is by, first of all, exporting a constant because we're going to use this schema inside this index file over here. So we need to import it later. So make sure you export it first. We'll call this type defs and we set this equal to a template string. And like we just saw, we start it with hash GraphQL. And notice when I press L now, it goes green. It's a signal we are gonna get syntax highlighting for this. Now inside here, we're gonna define our different types. And built into GraphQL, there are five basic scalar types that we can use. So they are ints, which are just basically whole numbers, floats, which are decimal numbers, we have strings, we have Boolean types, and also we have a special ID type as well. Now, the ID type is something that GraphQL uses as a key for data objects. Now, they're basically serialized as strings, and that's how we're going to declare the IDs in our data when we make it later, but they are their own unique type in GraphQL. And these five types right here are going to be the ones you find yourself using pretty much 99% of the time. You can make your own types to build on top of this and use them, which we'll see kind of later on. But yeah, these are the types we're going to be using. So let's delete that and then go up here. Now we want to make different data types for our different types of data that we're going to have later on. Now we're going to have three types of data. We're going to have game objects. We're going to have review objects and also author objects. So they're the three different types we need to define inside this template string. Now, the way we make a type is by saying type, first of all, then the name of the type. So we'll start with game. And then inside here, we'll define the different properties that a game 
data type should have. So it should have an ID property. And then we do a colon and we say, what data type is that using the five different types that we just saw? Well, this is going to be of type ID. And then the second property is going to be a title because every game needs a title. That's going to be a string. And then the third one will be a platform. Now that could be a string as well. However, it might have multiple platforms. So ideally we want this to be an array of strings. And we can say that something is an array of a certain type by just putting square brackets around it. So now we're saying the type of this property should be an array of strings. All right. So at the minute, if we were to make a new game using this type later on, there's nothing to say that these are required fields. Now we can make a field required by adding on the exclamation mark at the end of something. If we don't have that, then we're basically saying this is allowed to be null. If we have the exclamation mark, we're saying it's not allowed to be null. So I want all of these to be required. So this one, this one, and also this one. Now, right here, this exclamation mark is outside of the square brackets, meaning we must have a value for platform, which is an array of strings, but the arrays, uh, sorry, the elements inside that array can be nullable at the minute because we don't have an exclamation mark after this. So we need it there as well to say that this string can't be nullable. All right. So we need two here, one at the end of the entire value type, and then one for the type inside the array as well. Okay. So that's the first type done. Let's do another one. I'm going to say type review this time. And then inside here, we also want an ID, which is of type ID required. And then we also need a second property. And by the way, you don't need commas here. The second property inside the review, which is going to be the rating. And that's going to be an integer also required. And then the third one will be the content of the review. And that is going to be a string also required. So that's the second type. The third one is author. So type author and inside here again, we need an ID, which is required. We also need a name for the author, which is a string also required um, get rid of the commas. This is just habit. And then the third one is going to be the verified property. And that is going to be a Boolean. And this is just basically to say whether an author is verified on a site. We don't need that. I just want to demonstrate the different types that we can use. Okay then, so now we've made three different types, game, author, and review. Now there's one more special type that we need to make, and that's a type we're gonna call query. Now the query type is something that every GraphQL schema that you make needs to have. It's not optional, and its job is to define the entry points to the graph and specify the return types of those entry points. So for example, if I want users to be able to query the review data that we have and get back a list of reviews, then I need to specify that inside this query type. So I could make a field called reviews and then tell GraphQL that we expect the return type of this entry point to be a list of reviews. And now if we left the query type like this, we're essentially saying we only want to expose that one single entry point to the graph, meaning a user would only be able to enter the graph at this point, and then they'd be free to navigate around the graph to eventually get related data, but they wouldn't be able to jump in at any other point, whether that be a single review instead of a list of reviews or an author or a game, because we've not specified those entry points right here. So this query type is our way of gatekeeping entry onto the graph, if you like, and deciding where a user can jump into it initially. So let's make some more entry points for our users. So after reviews, we shall say games. And when a user lands on this, when they request all the games, we're going to send back a list of game objects. And the final one for now is going to be authors. And same again, it's going to be a list this time of author objects. Now, eventually we're going to allow landing points for single reviews, single authors, and single games. At the minute, we're just allowing a user to land on a list of reviews to grab them all. We'll see how to land on a single one later on. So then now we've defined our types and we've also made a query type to say where a user can essentially land on the graph or where queries can start from. The next thing we need to do is pass all these type definitions into the Apollo server that we made in the previous lesson. So first up, make sure these type defs are exported from this file so that we can then go ahead and import them in the index file somewhere near the top. So 
do that first of all. And then once you've done that, we can then pass them into the Apollo server that we created as the first argument. So the Apollo server knows about our different types and query entry points. And I just said as our first argument, I meant the first property in the object argument. But anyway, that's our first step completed, making our type defs to map out what the graph looks like. I also said that we need to pass another property into this Apollo server, and that was a resolvers object, which basically contains a bunch of resolver functions. And the resolver functions are there for us to handle any incoming requests and return data to the client. Because at the moment, all we've done is define what the graph looks like in terms of the data types that we have and the entry points. But we've not yet said how we want to handle requests or queries for that data. And that's what the resolver functions are for. So you can kind of think of the schema and the type definitions that we set up as like a map for Apollo to structure the graph, but they don't actually handle any queries. And then we make resolver functions to handle the queries based on our schema and type. So I hope that makes sense. So in the next lesson, we're going to take a look at that and we're going to try making some resolvers for the different types of data that we're making available. We're also going to set up some dummy local data that we can use on the server as well so that we've got something to send back to the client. So that's coming in the next lesson. Right then, so in the last lesson, we made our type definitions to describe the data on the graph and also specify the entry points to the graph using the special query type. And we pass those into the Apollo server so it knows how to set the graph up. Next up, we need to make some resolver functions, which allow us to decide how we respond to queries to the graph. So it might be that if a query comes in for all the games, then we could maybe fetch all the game's records from a database and return those as a response. Now, in our case, we don't have a database set up for this. And instead, I'm just going to use some local data stored in a variable in another file. But you could quite easily hook this up to whatever database you prefer and work with that data instead. So for now, what I'm doing is making a new file called underscore db.js, which stands for database. And this underscore thing isn't necessary. It's just a little naming convention I sometimes use when I'm making a data file. But anyway, inside this file, I'm going to paste in a bunch of data, which is essentially just three arrays stored in variables. One array for the reviews, one for the games, and one for the authors. And we can see the different properties that these objects inside the arrays have are the same ones that we defined in the types that we made in the last lesson. The only difference is that the reviews objects, we have a game ID property and also an author ID property. And this is for later when we start to talk about how data is related, but the rest of the properties match up to the ones that we defined in our different types. So if you want to grab this data as well, you can do it's all up on my repo. I'm going to leave the exact link to that file to grab this data down below the video. Anyway, now we have our data. Let's start making some resolver functions for the three entry points that we defined in our query type, because we need to send a response for queries to each of those. So then to make our resolver functions, we'll first make a new constant called resolvers. And then we're going to set that equal to an object. And inside this, we can make resolver functions for each different type that we defined. Now, to begin with, we want to make resolver functions for the query type because that root query type is where we define entry points to the graph and specify what data should be returned for them. We'll also be making resolver functions for other types later on as well, like the review type and author type when we start talking about related nested data. But for now, we just want to make resolver functions for every field defined in the root query type. So that's one for reviews, one for games and one for authors. And to do that, we make a property called query capital Q, which matches exactly the type name. And this property is going to be an object as well. And now we can define in this object resolver functions for each of the properties defined on our root query type. So the way this is going to work is that we need basically a resolver function for reviews called reviews, one for games called games and one for authors called authors and the names need to match. So if we go over here, our first one is going to be for games. And then this is a function which returns some data. And basically we want to return the data to a user that they've requested. Now they've requested games. So we need to send back an array of game objects. Now, in order to do this, we need access to this DB file. So let me import that at the top. I'm going to come to the top 
and say db and then just paste in this import. So import db from dot forward slash underscore db dot js. And then down here, we can use this to say db dot and then whatever the property is down here. So we've got games, authors, and reviews that match up to this data. So we want to send back db dot games. And that's all there is to it. We're sending back the array of games. Now remember, when a user makes a query, they can do so like this. So let me just do some comments like this. And if they make a query, they might make a query that looks like this games. And then inside here, they want specific properties like just the title. Now, if we're returning the full array right here, you think, well, we're returning the ID, the title, the platform as well. However, Apollo handles that for us. All it needs to know is where to grab the data. And then if we're just requesting the title from each of the games, it will do its magic on this data to take out any of the other stuff, like the platform and the ID, and it will just return the title property for each one. So we don't have to worry about which fields are returned. Apollo server is going to do that for us, okay? Which is really cool. So let's get rid of that. That's the first resolver function done, dead simple. So the second one is going to be for reviews. Let's do that. Come back to index and we'll say reviews. And this is also a function. We need to return db.reviews. And then the final one is going to be for authors. So let's do that, authors. And then inside here, we need to return db.authors. All right, and that's it. We've made our three now basic resolver functions for this data over here. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So before this works, we need to pass this resolvers object into here as the second property on this argument. So let's do that. We'll say resolvers. And that's it. So now what we want to do is start up this server so that we can test it from the front end. So let me do that by opening up the terminal. And if you've got Nodemon installed, you could type Nodemon and then the name of the file, which is what I'm going to do. And basically what Nodemon does is it restarts the server every time you make a change to the server. Otherwise, if you're just using Node and then the file name, you need to manually cancel the server every time you make a change and rerun it to pick up that change. So we're going to say Nodemon and then the name of the file we want to run, which is index. And hopefully, oops, we get an error. So what's the error? Du -du 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 -du. So refuse, did you mean review? Let me have a look at this. So we've got reviews down here. Let's go to schema. Oops, there it is. Okay. So this shouldn't be plural because it's a singular type inside a list. All right. So save that. And now hopefully this is going to work. I'm going to cancel out this process and run it again. And okay, the app crashed again. <laughs> we have another error. So let's have a look what this one is. Okay, address is already in use. Okay, so that's because I've got another instance of a GraphQL server up and running. So let me just close that down first of all. Okay, so I've just done that. I'm gonna cancel out of this again and try running it third time. Hopefully this is gonna work now. Okay, cool. So now the server is ready at port 4000, awesome. All right, so now if you visit localhost port 4000 in the browser, you're going to see Apollo Explorer. So it automatically spins this up for us so we can test out our GraphQL server. And let me just take you on a quick tour of this. First of all, if you go to schema, then you're going to see the different queries that we can currently make. So you can see it's looked at our code and it's seen the different queries we can make, the different entry points, our authors, games, and reviews right here. And it also shows the data type. So if we click on this, it's gonna show the different fields that, that data type has, and it shows what we can basically get back, all right? So we have those three data types right here. Also, if we look at scalar types, it's gonna come down here, it shows the different things we're using, directives. Okay, we don't really need to worry about directives for now. If you go back to Explorer, this panel on the left is where we're going to make the queries. This is where we're going to get the response. Down here, you might see another panel as well. This is for variables, which we're going to look at later on. So let's make our first query. You can name this something different if you want. So I could say something like games query to get the games. You don't have to name it that. It doesn't really matter what it's called. But now I want to get the games. So I can click on that. 
And remember, we have to open up our curly braces and specify what fields we want from this particular uh, resource. So I could say that I want the title of each game and also the platform of each game. So now if I click on this, we can see we get an array of all the games inside a data object. So we have this one, the title and the platform, title and platform and so forth. So we're getting all of the games. Awesome. All right, so let's change this to something else. Let's try the authors. And from each one, we want the name and we also want the verified status. Click on this and it's going to fetch those for us. Mario, verified true. Yoshi, false. Peach, true. Awesome. Final one, let us try the other resource, which is reviews. And then from here, we can get, for example, the ID, the rating and the content. I'm going to click on this and we can see all those reviews. Now, like I said, you can just request some of the field so I could get rid of content and I could get rid of ID and just say that I want the rating click on this and now it still fetches all the reviews but we only get that rating property so we're not over fetching which is awesome so even though we explicitly return the full array of data Apollo is using our resolver function and the data we return to automatically filter out any of the fields the user doesn't need which is awesome so this is all working now but what if we wanted to fetch just a single review or a single author or a single game? Well, for that, we need to use something called query variables. And we'll talk about those in the next lesson. All right then, gang. So now we have some type definitions, which describe the data we have in the graph and also specify the entry points to the graph, which are to query all the reviews, all the games and all the authors. And we also have resolver functions for each of those queries too, which return the data so it can be sent to the client. But what if a user just wants to send a query for a single review or a single author or a single game? Well, currently that wouldn't work for two reasons. First, we don't specify that a user can enter the graph in that way in the root query. The only three entry points that we have are queries for all the reviews, all the games or all the authors. And secondly, we don't have any resolver functions to handle queries for single items. We only have them to match these three entry points for lists of data. So we need to address both of those things, starting with this root query type. And the way we do that is by just adding more entry points to the graph. So underneath reviews, I'm going to make another query available called review singular for a user to fetch a single review. And that query is going to return a single review object. Now we need to add one more thing to this, and that's a query variable to say that when a user makes this query, we expect them to send a variable along with it as well. And that variable would be the ID of the review that they want to fetch because we need the ID to find the review in our data in order to send it back to them. So to do that, we just add parentheses after the query name and then we can add a variable name, which I'm going to call ID. And we also need to specify the type of this variable that we expect as well, which is going to be the ID type. And finally, we want to say that this variable is required when someone makes this query, so it can't be null. And we know to do that, we can just add the exclamation mark at the end of it. So now we're saying a user can make an initial query for a single review, but they must pass in this variable to the query, which must be an ID. So now we just need to make a resolver function for this query as well. So back in the index file, we can add a new function inside the query property of the resolvers object. And that function is going to be called review singular again. And inside this function, we basically need to return a single review based on the ID variable that a user passes into the query. So how do we get that ID in this resolver function? Well, we automatically get three arguments available to us in these functions that we can use. The first one is something called parents, which refers to the parent resolver in a resolver chain. That probably doesn't make much sense at the minute, but hopefully it will do later on when we start working with related data and nested queries. I'm going to rename this first one to underscore because we don't need that in this function. The second one, which we do need is called args, which stands for arguments. And it's on here that we can access any query variable sent with the query. The third one is a context object, which we can use for supplying context values across all of our resolvers, such as authentication information or something like that but we don't need that third argument right now. So we can get any query variables that a user sends in the query from this args object. And what we want is the ID variable. So we can just say 
args.id to get that. And we can use the ID now to find whatever review has the ID in our data and then return it. So the way I'm going to do this is by just taking db.reviews again. And then I'm going to use the find method to find a single review. So this find method basically finds a function for every item inside the reviews array. And for each item, we can take in the review as an argument. So if we go back to the data, if we're cycling through this, it will refer to this first, then this, then this, then this, okay? So each time we cycle through one of these items, we can check the ID property of it. Now, if the ID property matches the ID on this argument, then we want to return true inside this function. And when we return true, it no longer needs to cycle through the rest of the array and it just returns that value for us right here, okay? So we need to say, get the review.id, and see if it's triple equal to args.id. So when that is true, that is the review that we want to return to the user. Hope that makes sense. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So now we can save this and test it out in the browser. Okay, so how do we actually send a query variable from the front end when we're making a query? Well, first of all, after the query name, we can use parentheses to declare any variables that can be passed into this query as a whole. Now that can be multiple variables in the future, but for now, it's just gonna be one variable, the ID. And if you were using something like React to make this query, you could pass those variables into the whole query from a React component. And then within the query, we can use those variables for different parts of the query. So first of all, let's declare what variables can be passed into the query as a whole. So inside parentheses, we declare each variable that can be passed in using a dollar sign and then the variable name. So we can say dollar sign and then ID. And then after that, we use a colon and specify what type of data this variable should be. In our case, that's the ID type. For all intents and purposes, it's gonna be a string that we pass in, but it's an ID type. Now, in order to pass that variable into the query, from Apollo Sandbox, you can come down here to the bottom and select variables. And then you can make a JSON object of key value pairs, one for each variable. So we can add the ID one and set it to be one in quotations. So now these variables are gonna get passed into the query and populate the arguments inside the parentheses right up here. So this variable will now have the value that we passed in from down here and we can use that variable when we request a single review inside this query. So let's do that. Let's ask for a single review and then pass in the ID of the review that we want to find. So we can say ID is equal to the ID variable, which in turn is equal to one. And that's all we have to do to say that we want that one single review. We can also specify which fields we want back as well though, for example, the rating and also the content properties. So now we're asking for one single review with the ID of one, and we just want these two fields for that review. And if we hit send, we should see the response from the server, which contains that review and inside it, the two fields that we asked for, awesome. So that's how we use query variables from the front end. Now let's try and do something similar for the other two data types that we've got. All right then, so back in the schema, let's define our different entry points. So underneath games, I'm gonna do a single one, so game, and that's gonna return a single game object. Now again, we need to declare that this needs an ID argument or variable, which is of type ID and that's required. And same for this down here, author. And again, we need to define the query variable, which is of type ID and required, and that returns a single author. So that's the schema done. Back over in index, we need to basically do the same thing for author and game that we did for review. So I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it up here, change the name of this to game, and we still need the args. The whole logic is the same. However, we just need to rename this to game and this to game as well. So we're basically returning the game where the IDs match. And then down here, we need a comma, first of all and we have authors, so let's paste this in again, do a comma, change this to author singular, and we'll change this to author, and change this to author, and also we need to change this one right here because we want to look inside the games array, and this one should be the authors 
array. I think that's pretty much it. So now this should all work for the other two types as well, but let's check it out in Apollo Explorer. So then let's give this a whirl. I'm not gonna change the name because it doesn't really matter, but we're always still passing in the ID and we'll just pass in one, it doesn't have to change. I mean, we'll change it to two just to have a look. And then this time instead of review, in fact, let's try review first of all to see if we can get a different one back, which we do, okay. Now let's change this to game with the ID of two. Now we need different fields for the game. I think we have a title and also a platform. I'm also gonna return the ID just to make sure it's getting the correct one. And we can see the ID is two, the title and also the platforms. Uh, let's try a different one. So we'll say three here, send that. Okay, yeah, that works. And then finally, let's try the authors. So singular author, I'm gonna go back to one and we want the name and we'll also get the verified status. That's it, verified like so, and the ID. Press this send button and we can see this works as well. Let's change the variable to two and yeah, it brings back the Yoshi one, the different one. Awesome, so this is all working now. That's how we can send query variables in our queries. All right then, so things are starting to take shape now. We can query lists of data and also we can query single data items as well using query variables. And now I wanna take this one step further and talk about related data in GraphQL. So if we open up the DB data file and look at the reviews data, we can see that each review has an auth ID property and also a game ID property. And that's the way in our data, we're relating these different things so that every review has an associated author and associated game as well. So if I was to pluck out a random review, I would then be able to try and find the author and the game associated with that review. And likewise, if I was to pick out a random game, I could look at the ID of that game and then run through the reviews array to find any review where the game ID matches that, meaning I could pick out all the reviews associated with a single game. Now, that's how this looks on the data side of things. But currently in our schema, we don't really define any relationships between the data. So when Apollo makes our graph based on this schema, it won't know that every game has a list of related reviews at the moment, and that every review has a related author and game, and also that every author has a list of reviews that they wrote. So we need a way of defining those relationships in our schema so that Apollo knows to make our graph that way with those relationships. All right, so let's start with the review type right here. So we know that every review is associated with a game and an author. So I could say that the game is going to be of type game like so, and that's required, right? Because we can't have a review for no game, that's not gonna exist. Also, we have the author property, which is gonna be of type author. Again, required because every review needs an author. All right, so down here, Every game is gonna have a list of reviews. So we'll say reviews. It's a list, so square brackets, and then inside the type is review. Now, the types inside this can't be nullable, the data inside it, so we need exclamation mark right here, but that's not to say that we have to have reviews. We're not gonna put exclamation mark right here. This can be nullable as a whole if the game doesn't have any reviews, but if we have some data inside this list, it has to be of type review. That is required, it can't be null, okay? So same down here for the author. Let's say the reviews by this author are gonna be a list of review objects. Again, exclamation mark, but not at the end because there can be authors that haven't written any reviews yet, all right? Okay, so now we've made those connections in our different types. We also need to make some resolver functions to resolve any nested queries for the related data. For example, I might query it for a single game and then make a nested query for all the reviews for that game. And that query would look something like this, where the initial jumping in point is for a single game, but then we also ask for the reviews related to that game, along with the rating and content for each review. So at the moment, Apollo doesn't really know how to handle that nested query for the reviews inside a specific game. The only way it knows how to resolve reviews currently is either by grabbing all of them or just by grabbing one of them based on the ID. And these are both root queries defined in the query type in our schema. So it doesn't know how to get a subset of reviews based on the ID of a particular game. We don't have a resolver for that. So the way we make this resolver is not by making it inside this query object, 
because these are resolvers for entry points to the graph as defined by the query type that we made in the schema. So instead, because this nested request is associated with a game object, we make a new property inside the resolvers object called game, which is also an object. And then inside this, we can make a resolver function called reviews, where we can tell Apollo how to get all the reviews based on the parent query for the single game. So I'm going to make a function called reviews to do this. And it's going to take in that first argument called parent. Now, remember, I mentioned this one in a previous video, but we didn't need it back then. However, now we do need it. So the way this is going to work is because our entry point for the query is a single game, Apollo will run that initial resolver function inside the query object to get that single game. Then to resolve the reviews for that game, it's going to look to the game object since that's what we just grabbed, right? A game. And then it's going to look for the reviews resolver inside that to grab the reviews. So it's inside this function that we tell Apollo how to do that. But how do we know what game we're getting reviews for? Well, we can access the ID of the game via the parent argument because the parent argument is a reference to the value returned by the previous or parent resolver. Now, in our case, that's going to be the game one. So the initial one inside the query object. So that parent argument will basically be a game object and that game object is going to have an ID, which we can then use. So we can use the ID now to return all the reviews associated with that game ID. And the way we're going to do this is by first of all, returning DB, which is the data, remember that we imported, and then we want the reviews array on that. Then we're going to use the filter method. So what we're going to do is filter out any review that doesn't have the same game ID as the ID on the parent, because if they are the same and we return true, for each of those, then it's going to keep those in the filtered array. And that's what we want. Any review associated with the game where the IDs match. If they don't match, it's going to filter them out and they're not returned in that array. So we fire a function for each item inside the array. I'm going to refer to each review item as R. And then we want to return R.game underscore ID. Remember, that is the property. If we go over here, each review has a game underscore ID to associate it with a particular game. And we want to check if that matches with a particular game, the game we've just queried. So we'll say triple equal to the parent, which has the ID property, because that is essentially the game object. So where they match, they're going to stay in the returned array because they're associated with each other. And that's what we want. We want to return all the reviews associated with that game. Where they don't match, they're filtered out. So we don't return those. OK, so let's save this and give it a whirl. OK, then, so I've got this query already set up. So we're using a query variable ID, which we're passing right here. So ID two, we ask for the game with the ID and grab the title, but also all the reviews associated with that particular game ID. And we we'll get the rating and the content from each one. So let's give this a whirl. And yep, cool. So we can see we get the game title and two reviews right here. And what I'm going to do is also put in here the game ID, let me do commas here, like so. And then I'll say the game underscore ID, that should be two. Oh, in fact, we can't do that. And the reason we can't do that is because we didn't specify that on our schema. All right, so I'm not gonna do that. But if you remember in our different types on the review object, we didn't add the game ID. That is something you could do if you wanted to, but it's not gonna work here because I didn't add it. But either way, we can see that this works. And if I put in a different ID like three and try that out, we can see now we get a different game with one review. I'm going to put in an ID of one here. And yep, that's working as well. Awesome. OK, so we've sorted out related data when it comes to finding reviews for a game. But reviews can also be associated with an author, can't they? So if we take a look at author, they could have a list of reviews as well. So let's do the same thing for author. So like we had a game property, this time we need an author property like so which is an object. And then we want the reviews resolver for this, where we take in the parents and then inside there, we're going to do essentially the same thing as this. So let's return reviews.filter. This time we want to check the author ID is equal to the parent ID. 
All right. So the author ID on the review, remember, we have that right here. We're checking this against the ID of the author we selected. And then we're only returning the reviews where if this was the author, for example, one, we'd return this one and this review. OK, so let's save that. I'm not going to test it just yet because there's one more set of resolvers I want to do, and that's for the reviews. So imagine we select a single review. If we go to our schema, we can see that each review has an associated game and author. So they would be nested queries. So we need to make a resolver function to get the game associated with that review and also the author. So two resolver functions are, uh, right here. So let's do the author first of all. And we take in the parents. So the parent this time is going to be a single review. And we're going to return db dot authors. And then we're going to find a single author because this is a list of authors associated with a single review. We only have one author per review. So we're finding a single one. So we fire a function for each element in the array. And I'm going to call each element a for author. And then what we want to do is grab the ID of that. So a dot ID. And we want to return true when it's equal to the parent, which is the review object, dot author ID. So where they match, it means that author is associated with this review and we're returning that single author. Now we need to do the same thing. But this time it's going to be for the game because again, a single game is associated with a particular review. So game, and then we'll change this to G, change this to G for game, and then this is going to be game underscore ID. And that's all there is to it. Oops, this needs to be games right here. Cool. So now we have our resolver functions for nested authors and games inside a review object and also for reviews inside an author. All right. Cool. So let's save this and try it out again. All right, then. So let's start the starting off point as author. We'll keep the ID as one that we pass in. We want the author name. And then we'll get the reviews associated with the author. So we'll press that and we can see Mario has these reviews right here, these two. Awesome. And then let's try author with the ID of two. Like so. So we have Yoshi and these three reviews. Awesome. So that's working. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'm going to make a new query so we can come back to this. And I'm going to paste it in here and just change it. So we'll change this to review query. And then we'll pass in an ID again. So let me go back here and copy this. Like so, paste it in. And then we want a single review right here with that ID. We're going to get the rating of that review. But then also we want the associated game. And for the game, we will get the title and the platform like so. Oops. Platform. Press send and we can see now we get the review and the single game associated with that review, which is awesome. We also can get the author, remember? So let's do that as well. And for the author, we want the name and also we'll get the verified property as well, which is true or false. So now we get the author as well. Awesome. Change the ID and those should change as well. Yep, cool. Awesome. So this is all working. Now, not only this, but what I could do is I could get a single review and the rating, get the game that is associated with that review. And I could also say, well, I tell you what, get me all the other reviews associated with that game. And from those, I could just get the rating. Now, the reason I can do this is because we have a resolver chain. So the first one, the entry point, is for a single review, right? So we use that initial resolver function defined inside the query object to get that single review. Then we move on to the game resolver inside the review object. So it gets the game associated with that review. That's the, um, that's the resolver function we just made. And then since we're asking for reviews inside a game, it goes to the resolver function for reviews inside the game object. And this time the parent refers to this right here. So we have this kind of resolver chain and we always have access to the previous resolver as the parent. So we can nest as much as we want here and this is going to work, which is awesome. So we get the review and the rating for that review, the game associated with it and all the other reviews 
along with the rating for that particular game. Awesome. All right then, my friends. So now we can do quite a lot in terms of making queries to fetch data and related data as well, which is cool. But at the moment, all we can do is fetch the data. We can't add new data or edit the current data or delete data or any of that jazz. So I want to address that now by talking about mutations. And a mutation is basically a generic term in GraphQL for any kind of change that we want to make to the data, whether it be to add new data, delete data, or edit current data. So the first thing we need to do is define our allowed mutations in the schema by making a new type, which is called mutation. And it's inside this type that we can then decide how users can mutate any data. For example, I might want to expose a mutation called delete game. And for that mutation, we need an ID argument to say what game should be deleted. We also specify the return type as well after a user makes this mutation, much like we did for the root queries. So for example, once a user deletes a game from the data, I might want to send back an updated list of all the games after that one has been removed. So I'd use an array of game objects right here. Okay, so that's the mutation defined, but we also need to make a resolver for the mutation as well. Inside our resolvers object, called mutation. So right at the bottom down here, comma, and then mutation, which is an object. And we just make resolvers in much the same way as we did for these, for these, etc. So we want to make a resolver called delete game right here. So let's do that. Delete game like so. And it also takes in the same arguments. So we have the parent, we also have the args over here and then context if we want it. So we don't actually need the first one, which is parent to delete a game, but we do need the arguments because we want the ID of the game that we wanted to delete. So inside here, oops, inside here, what we want to do is basically update the value of the games array because that's what we're editing right here. We're deleting a game. So we want to remove one, right? So let's say that db.games is equal to something new and that's gonna be db.games.filter. And by the way, in a real application, you probably use a database, right? Like maybe MongoDB or something like that. So you would use the library for MongoDB to connect to that and just delete a game this way. We're just using local variables as data because then it's easier for me to keep the focus on GraphQL. All right, anyway, so dot filter. So we wanna go through this array and we fire a function for each game, which I'm referring to as G inside this array. And we want to return false uh, whereby the ID is equal to the ID on here. And we're returning false in that scenario because if we return false, it filters it out of the array and therefore the filtered array is not gonna include that game that we want to delete. So we say g.id is not equal to args.id. So where they're not equal, it returns true and it keeps that in the array. Where they are equal, that's the game we wanna delete, it returns false and therefore we filter it out the array, all right? So now we also need to return something and we specified the return type to be a list of games. So the updated games array. So all we need to do then is return db.games like so. All right, so let's save this and give it a whirl. So how do we actually make a mutation from the front end? Because when we make a query, we use this query keyword, give it a name and then specify what we want. Now with a mutation, it's very similar. We just specified that it's a mutation, not a query anymore. Then we can give this a name. So I could call it delete mutation. We can specify any variables that need to go into this query. And we do need a variable. That's gonna be the ID. And that's gonna be of ID type. And then inside here, we can specify what mutation we wanna make. And that was called delete game. So let me get rid of this because it's automatically created it for us. And this should be ID instead to refer to this. So now we need to pass in the ID variable down here. And that is going to be two. So we're deleting the game with the ID of two. And remember, we get back as a return an array of games with that game deleted. So an updated version of it. So we can specify now what fields we want back. So I could say we want the ID of the game back, the title and the platform. So let's give this a whirl, delete mutation. All right, so now we can see ID one and three and four and five, but no two because it's been deleted. 
Now, obviously, when the server restarts, that is going to be there again because we reinitialize the variables and all that jazz. This is not permanent, this deletion. It's only while, you know, this current session is going on, if you like. But as soon as we restart the server, that's going to return. But like I said, you'll probably use a database where you'll have a bit more persistence than this. So anyway, now we've deleted a game, let's also try adding a new game. Okay, so now we've made this delete game mutation. Next, I wanna try making a mutation whereby a user can add a new game. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to go to the mutation type in the schema and we need to add the mutation, which I'm gonna call add game. And it's gonna accept some arguments. So we do need parentheses, but we'll come back to those in a second. Now, as a return value, we're gonna send a single game object back to the user, the one that we just created. So for the arguments of this mutation, we need to basically grab all of the fields that make up a new game, minus one of them, the ID, because we don't want the user to decide the ID of the new game that they add. Instead, we're gonna generate a random ID in the resolver later for this mutation. But we still need the game title and maybe the game platform, maybe the game price if there is one, basically any property that makes up a new game. So we could add each of those fields as different arguments inside here, or we could make a new special input type in our schema, which allows us to group together several arguments into one type. And then that can be used as a single argument elsewhere, like in this mutation. So the way we do that is by coming down here and first of all saying input instead of type which says to GraphQL that this isn't an actual type of data, but more of a collection of fields that we can use in a mutation as a single argument, for example. So inside this then, we can choose what fields we want this input to have, and also the type of those fields. So I've said right here, we need two properties, the title, which is a string, and also the platform, which is a collection of strings or a list of strings, and they're both required. We don't wanna add in the reviews because we're not making a review, we're just making a game, and then later, if you were to have a review, you would associate it with a particular game. We don't need to do that right here when we're adding a game for the first time. But now what we can do is we can say, okay, this mutation takes in a variable called game, and that is gonna be of type add, game input and it's required. So when we're making this mutation from the front end, it's gonna require us to add a game variable which looks something like this, an object with these two properties, okay? So now we have that mutation sorted, we can go back to the index file and we can add that mutation right here after delete game. So I will call this add game. and We're gonna take in the args argument. So we don't need the first one which is parent, so underscore for that, then args. And the reason we need that is because the game property is gonna be on the arguments because we're sending that from the front end and on that game is gonna be the title and platform properties. So what do we wanna do here? Well, we want to make a new game object and add it to the game array, right? So we can make the object first of all by saying let game equal to an object. Then we're gonna spread out, so dot, 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 args, dot, game. And it's dot game because that is the name of this variable. And on that will be those two properties, the title and the platform. So we're adding those two properties to the new object. And then the reason I'm spreading that is because we also need an ID property, which we need to randomly generate. Now you might be better off using some kind of random UID generator library or something like that. I'm gonna use the math object to generate this for the sake of our tutorial, but we're gonna say math.floor, then math.random. And this generates a random number between zero and one in decimal format and then we'll times that by 10,000. So what this will do is generate a random number between one and 10,000, and it will have decimal points as well, but then what we're doing is flooring that so it becomes an integer, okay? And then we'll convert it to string like so. So we have our ID property. We also have the other arguments that we passed along, and we have the new game object now. We just need to push that to the game's array, so we can say, let me come back up a line, db.push, and then we're gonna push on, in fact, not db.push, db.games.push to push onto the games array. And we push on the new game, awesome. And then finally, we return that new game that we created because if we go to the schema, we can see we return a game type. All right, so that is pretty much it, my friends. So let's try this from the front end. Okay then, so let me just copy this and then we'll go over here 
and paste it in. And we're going to call this one add mutation. We also need to pass in the ID. No, we don't, in fact, do we? We need to pass in a game object. And that is of type add game input, like so. All right, so now we need to specify that the game is required here, like so. And then this is called add game instead. All right, so now down here, we need to pass the variables in. So remember, we need a game property, and that is an object. And inside the object, we have the title. So we'll just say a new game, very original, right? And then we also need a platform, and that platform is going to be an array. And inside here, we will say switch and PS5, like so. So remember, it returns the new game back and we're requiring these three fields from the returned game. So let's try this, add mutation. And you can see now we get this random ID 263, the title and the platform. Awesome, so that's worked. And now I'm gonna go back over here and I'm gonna just require all of the games right here. So games like so, we don't need these anymore. Just so we can see an updated list of games and we'll get the title of each one. And we don't need these parentheses. Let's run this and you can see now a new game. So it's been pushed on to the array, awesome. So in the next lesson, we're gonna look at one more mutation and that is to update existing data. All right then, so in the last lesson, we made our first two mutations, one to add a game and one to delete a game. And for adding a game, we made this add game input where we collated two fields together. So that could be our variable right here, just this one variable called game, which has this kind of structure. So we're gonna do one more mutation now, and that is gonna be for editing a game. So I'm gonna come down to the bottom and I will make a new one called update game, like so. Now in here, we need some arguments. Now, what do we need? We need the ID of the game that we want to update. And we didn't need an ID here, remember, because we're adding a new game that doesn't have an ID yet. But when we're updating existing data, we need the ID of the game that we want to update. So let's put that in. But we also need any kind of edits that we want to make, all right? So what I'm gonna do is make another argument called edits. And for this, I'm gonna create a new input. So let me copy this and paste it down here. And I'm gonna call this edit game input. And then we'll set that here, edit game input like so. And we're not gonna make this, yeah, in fact, we will make this required. Okay, and this is gonna return game. Now, these things right here, these two fields, they are the same. So you might be thinking, well, why didn't we just reuse this one here? And the difference is that I'm not gonna make these two required. Because if you go to update a game, you might just want to update one of the fields like title. So I don't want to make therefore the platform required if you don't want to update that. And likewise, if you just update the platform, you might not want to update the title. So therefore I don't want to make this required. So if I reuse this, we would have to basically update both of the fields in order for this to work. But I don't want to make a user do that. So by making a new one where they're not required, it's a bit more flexible. And also, I'm not putting the ID in here, like so, and instead I'm specifying it here. And the reason for that is because it's not really an edit, is it? So I don't want to group the ID into some kind of edits object. I'd like that to be its own separate argument. So let me delete that, save it, and now we can create a resolver function for this update game mutation. All right then, so let's add this in down here, update game like so, and we don't need the first argument, the parent, but we do need the args because the edits and also the ID are gonna be on that. And then down here, what I'm gonna do is just paste in a bit of code. And this is what we're using to basically update the games array. So we're taking the games on DB and we're setting it equal to db.games.map. So we're mapping through the array and basically creating a new array out of it. So we fire a function for each item in the array. And for each item we check does that particular game that we're currently iterating have an ID that is equal to the ID on the arguments? Because remember, we're gonna have an ID property on this right here. And if it does match, then we're gonna return this thing right here, G, so the current 
object, if you like, and spread those. So whatever properties it currently has, we're adding right here. And then we're also spreading args.edits. So if, for example, we update the title, then it's going to override the title that's over here that we're spreading. Does that make sense? So that's the returned object right here. And that's going to go inside the array then. If these don't match, then we don't need to change it and we just return the original object to the array. So I hope that all makes sense. Now, at the end of this update game mutation, we need to return something back to the user. So if we take a look at the schema, we return the game that we just edited. So we shall say return, and then we'll say db.games.find to find a particular game. And we can cycle through those. And we want to return the game where the ID is equal to args dot id because again remember we have the id argument right here okay cool so now we have that mutation let's try it out okay then so back over here i'm going to create a new tab and i'm going to copy this mutation which is for adding a game i'm going to paste it over here and then i will call this edit mutation and this right here needs to be edit game input and this is called edits this and this right here is edits and dollar sign edits. But also remember, we need to pass in the ID. So we can say the ID is equal to, oops, we need dollar sign first of all. ID is of ID type, like so. We need the ID right here. So let's say the ID is the ID variable. Awesome. Okay, this is not add game, it's update game, like so. And we don't pass in the ID. We can pass in a title and a platform. Well, mind you, these are what we're going to get back. So we can pass in the ID here if we want to. For the variables, let's copy this again. Because it's going to be very similar. And paste it right here. So we're going to have an edits property. And we also need an ID property. So let's do the ID down here. Oops. Done that incorrectly. Comma here. And then ID. We'll set that equal to two and we'll change this to, I don't know, Dark Souls, like so. And then we don't need to pass in an update for this. So let's just do that. So then we're going to get these fields back. So what we're doing is we're passing in the edits right here, of which we just have one, the title, and then the ID of the game we want to edit. So we're passing both of those in here and then we're using those inside this mutation and we're saying, look, once you've made this mutation, this edit, send back the game and give us the title and platform. So the title should be updated now. So let's do that. And we can see now the title is Dark Souls. The platform is unchanged. If I change instead the platform, and this needs to be an array of strings now, doesn't it? And we'll just change this to be, I don't know, um, Xbox, whatever. Let's edit that. Again, and now it's just Xbox. I can change this now to PS5 if I wanted to. And we'll do Switch as well. And also, if we wanted to change the title as well, we can do. So we'll just say, I don't know, some other game. Can't think off the top of my head. Edit. And we can see now we've made those edits. Awesome. All right then, gang. So that's pretty much it for this series then. I really hope you enjoyed it and hopefully you feel comfortable now with the basics of GraphQL in terms of making a GraphQL server, but also in terms of the query syntax and actually making queries from the front end. And uh, if not, then I guess thanks anyway for wasting the last two hours of your life watching my videos. But yeah, hopefully not. And fingers crossed it wasn't a complete waste of time. But anyway, in the future, I will do more courses to incorporate GraphQL, like how to use GraphQL in a Next.js site or maybe with Superbase or something like that. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to make this course right here so that it serves as a jumping in point to learn the basics of GraphQL quickly so we can do more advanced stuff in the future.